Don't forget you can find early episodes right now at tunein.com slash serial killers or just download the free TuneIn app and search serial killers. We love hearing from our listeners about serial killers that intrigue you, and we've had several requests for one in particular, Jack the Ripper. Discussing the most notorious serial killer of all time is no simple undertaking, and since the Ripper's crimes remain unsolved, we recruited our friends Carter and Wendy, hosts of the podcast Unsolved Murders True Crime Stories, to help. We're releasing three bonus episodes on Jack the Ripper. We'll have a new episode out every Thursday for the next three weeks. The episodes will drop on your regular Serial Killers feed, in addition to our regular episodes on Mondays. Or for those of you who like binge listening, all three special episodes will be released November 2nd on TuneIn. Just search Jack the Ripper on the free TuneIn app or TuneIn.com. We hope you enjoy. Due to the graphic nature of this killer's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. I love you, Gwen. I think you're great. For this afternoon, I cannot wait. That's when I'll wake up and that's when I'll kiss you. That's when I'll hold you. Oh, Gwen, I miss you. Bunny hop over here and let me lick you on the ear. I want to get married right now, right away. Don't make me wait till the day. When you're mine, oh, please say, you'll be mine forever in five days. What you've just heard is the text of a poem written by Kathy Wood to her then-lover, Gwendolyn Graham, nearing the end of their tenure as nurses at the Alpine Manor Nursing Home. At first glance, it appears to be a tender expression of love from one woman to another. The only possible crime the author has committed is the crime of amateur poetry. But this poem, scrawled on a sheet of nurse's notes stationery, was actually the artifact of an abusive relationship the chronicle of a vicious medical killing spree which claimed the lives of at least five Alpine Manor patients in Walker, Michigan. Hi, I'm Greg Polson, and this is Serial Killers. Today we're going to take a deep dive into the lives of Gwendolyn Graham and Kathy Wood, a pair of nurses who melded murder with their sexual relationship leading the papers to label them the Lethal Lovers. I'm here with my co-host, Vanessa Richardson. Vanessa's not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she's done a lot of research for this show. Hi, everyone. We'd like to ask a quick favor. Would you leave a five-star review of Serial Killers on your favorite podcast directory? It seems so simple, but it really helps us out. And don't forget to subscribe while you're there, because a new episode comes out every Monday. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram, at Parcast, and on Twitter, at Parcast Network. A quick note. In this week's episode, all quotes will be performed by actors. However, these lines are quoted from primary research sources and presented exactly as those people stated them. In the winter of 1987, from the month of January to the month of March, nurses Gwendolyn Graham and Kathy Wood smothered five of their patients as part of a murderous love pact. They targeted the weakest among the old and sickly people they were charged to protect, women with Alzheimer's and dementia. They killed for thrills, sexual gratification, and the hope that the killings would forever bind them together. In the end, their hopes became a gruesome reality. It's hard to believe a person who selects a normally selfless career like nursing would murder their own patients. I know what you mean, Greg. It follows that they're one of the rarest types of serial killers. Mm -hmm. They're called angels of death, medical killers. Like you said, they are the rarest of three main types of serial murders defined by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. What separates medical killers from the other two types, organized and disorganized killers, is that they become involved in the medical industry to satisfy their pathological desires. Gwen Graham and Kathy Wood were medical killers, but their case stands out because of a number of unusual details. They worked as a team and carried out the killings as part of the basis for their sexual relationship. Why would this type of relationship ever develop? 
The answers to that question are embedded within the psychology of these two women. Mm, let's jump right into it. Mm. Many of the pathologies exhibited by serial killers, especially those with sexual motivations, are rooted in childhood experience. From what we discussed prior to the show, it sounds like Gwen Graham and Kathy Wood both had extremely turbulent youths. Let's start there. Okay, we'll begin with Gwen. Gwen Graham spent most of her formative years on a farm outside of Tyler, Texas, where her family moved shortly after she finished the fifth grade. Her father was a hard man, with hard-set, provincial, and often abusive ideas about how a child should be raised. He believed Gwen needed to understand the processes of life and death. He tried to teach her by forcing her to watch the beheading of chickens and the slaughter of pigs. At a young age, she became well acquainted with the processes which turn animals from living creatures into food. But this early introduction to death didn't stop with just livestock. When Gwen was 11 years old, her dog Misty barked at a horse, causing the rider to be thrown. Gwen's father made her watch as he forced her brother to shoot the little dog. The experience haunted Gwen. So much so that shortly after her dog's death, she went into the yard where Misty was buried and dug up her remains. She couldn't let go of the trauma, just like she couldn't let go of Misty's teeth and skull, which she kept in an alabaster heart box until her arrest. That certainly sounds like a traumatic experience, Greg, especially for a child. Children are disproportionately affected by the death of a loved one or an animal because they lack the experience of adults. They have difficulty with finality and entertain fancies of their loved one returning from the dead. When they're exposed to death at a young age and in such a cruel, callous manner, they find the experience difficult to process. A parent or other mentor can help them understand death, but it sounds like Gwen's father had a really sick idea of parenting. Where was her mother through all of this? Did she have a close relationship with Gwen? Unfortunately, no. Her father's tyrannical parenting style also tainted Gwen's relationship with her mother. A hard and fast rule he kept in their household was that Gwen was never to be held by her mother while she was a baby. He believed that giving a child over to its mother's embrace made the child weak. As a result, Gwen spent most of her early development untouched by her mother. It's taken as common knowledge that a baby needs to be held by its mother. But what psychological effects does this sort of deprivation have on a child? Could Gwen's separation from her mother have contributed to her development into a serial killer? Absolutely. Children who don't receive maternal support do worse in school, have stunted emotional development, and are far more likely to develop psychological disorders such as early onset depression. Do they need their mother or can dad do the job? Actually, yes. Paternal support does the trick. A study published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found that as long as a child is nurtured by a parent, it doesn't matter which sex that parent is. Hmm. But Gwen received care from neither. What's the reason behind the psychological problems that form when a child isn't held by a parent? You might be surprised to hear that psychological problems caused by a lack of nurture are actually rooted in biology. Studies have shown that the human brain's physical development is influenced by the psychosocial development which is supposed to occur during childhood. Nurturing a child early in its development stimulates growth of the hippocampus, the region of the brain associated with learning, memory, and stress responses. In addition, these early social experiences increase the volume of the amygdala, responsible for the processing and memory of emotional reactions. It's more than likely these parts of Gwen's brain never fully developed because she was neglected in childhood. And that's why she had difficulty coping with stress and controlling her emotions, both hallmarks of serial killer personalities. That's right, Greg. Those are also symptoms of borderline personality disorder. Go on, though. Was there any other turbulence in Gwen's youth that we haven't discussed yet? Well, in her teenage years, uh, Gwen's father became a violent substance abuser. On many occasions, he got excessively drunk and sexually molested her. At this dark time in her life, Gwen started to cut herself and put cigarettes out on her arms. By the time she left home, Gwen had 31 different scars up both her arms, from cigarette burns and razor blades. Wow, it sounds like BPD. People with borderline personality disorder often displace their emotional pain by inflicting physical pain upon themselves. Hurting themselves physically distracts them from their emotional pain. Later in life, Gwen claimed her identity as a lesbian. 
Could her molestation have contributed to her sexual orientation? Well, I'm not sure, Greg. There is an ongoing debate regarding the origins of homosexuality. Some experts believe that people are born gay, while others insist that homosexuality develops later in life. There's evidence on both sides. Is molestation a factor specifically? Again, it's unclear. Studies have found that male homosexuals report childhood sexual abuse with significantly more frequency than heterosexual males. However, this might be due to the fact that heterosexuals are less likely to report being raped by a member of the same sex. Well, wait, why are we talking about men if these killers are female? Well, there's less to talk about. A relationship between homosexuality and childhood sexual abuse was far more visible in cases involving men. Well, why is that? I found an explanation in a study published in the Archives of Sexual Behavior entitled, Does Physical Abuse, Sexual Abuse, or Neglect in Childhood Increase the Likelihood of Same-Sex Sexual Relationships and Cohabitation? A prospective 30-year follow-up. <sighs> It seems like psychologists have a running competition to see who can come up with the longest, most confusing title for their research. <laughs> I can't argue with that. But regardless of what it was called, it had some good information. In their study, psychologists Kathy Whittam and Helen Wilson found that women commit less than 7% of sexual offenses against children. And because of this, boys who are sexually abused in childhood are far more likely than young girls to be forced into a homosexual encounter. That type of experience could make a heterosexual boy doubt his sexuality. But since Gwen was molested by a person of the opposite sex, this was never an issue. Yes. However, being molested by a man could have had such a negative impact on her that she felt safer with a woman, especially when it came to intimacy. Mm, I see. Well, that's about all I've got for Gwen's childhood. What do you say we move on to Kathy's youth? Mm, good idea. We'll do that right after this break. Time to share a ParCast favorite. I have to admit, I'm turning into a smoothie addict. Oh, really? And what started this? Well, ever since I started making my daily harvest smoothies, I just can't get enough. Their smoothies are so delicious and convenient. Daily Harvest sends Superfood Eats straight to your door with your choice of smoothies, activated breakfast bowls, or nice cream vegan sundaes. The single serving cups come frozen both preserving the nutritional value of the ingredients and providing you with food that can be prepared in no time at all. Exactly. When I'm in a rush to get my kids to school in the morning, all it takes is 30 seconds to add almond milk or water to the smoothie cup and blend it up. Go to daily-harvest.com and enter promo code SERIALKILLERS to get three items free off your first box. That's promo code SERIALKILLERS for three free Daily Harvest cups at daily-harvest.com. daily-harvest.com. What if shopping could be as convenient as Daily Harvest smoothie delivery? Well, now it can. Stitch Fix is an online styling service that mails clothes, shoes, and accessories picked just for you. All you have to do is fill out your style profile online, and Stitch Fix does the rest. So they just send you a box of clothes whenever you want? Yes. There's no subscription required. You can get your fix monthly, quarterly, or whenever you feel like it. So if you have an event coming up and need a new outfit, or if you just feel like revamping your wardrobe a bit, you can order a Stitch Fix box. So what's in each box exactly? Well, each box contains five items you can try on at home. So you can see what works with your wardrobe. You only pay for the items you keep. Well, that's really cool. Get started now at stitchfix.com slash cereal. And you'll also get 25% off when you keep all five items in your box. That's stitchfix.com slash cereal. To try Stitch Fix today, stitchfix.com slash cereal. Now back to the story. Kathy Wood was born at an army base in Washington State, where her father was stationed in 1962. After Kathy's sister Barbara was born, the family moved to Massachusetts. Shortly thereafter, her father was shipped off to fight in the Vietnam War. He wasn't around often. Barbara recollects that growing up in a military family fostered a strong bond between her and Kathy. But aside from her sister, Kathy had difficulty forming relationships and didn't socialize often. She was a smart kid, fascinated by books, and spent a lot of time alone in her bedroom reading. Barbara speculates that she did this to escape social life on the schoolyard, where the other children were very cruel to her. Kathy was a big girl, tall and also heavy. 
As cruel as other children were, the biggest hit to her self-esteem likely came from her father. He wasn't around often, preoccupied with his military career, and when he was, he was not supportive. Our society pressures young girls to be beautiful way too much. When they start to mature sexually, this pressure redoubles. What was puberty like for Kathy? Tough, it seems. When Kathy was 13, the age she had started to become interested in boys, her father criticized her mercilessly for her physical appearance and made her feel very ugly. Despite low self-esteem, Kathy got into a relationship with a boy named David, who drove a pink Cadillac sporting a bumper sticker which read, Labor Pains. The two went to movies, made out in David's car, and generally carried out a normal relationship. Until the day Kathy had met David's mother. She went to David's home, the pink Cadillac parked conspicuously in the driveway, and asked for him. Hello. Is David home? His mother was confused. She didn't have a boy. She had a girl. She led Kathy inside and showed her a photograph. It was a girl with long flowing hair wearing a floral pattern dress. It was David. It must have been quite a shock. I know, I did not see that coming. Well, surely, Greg, but I meant for Kathy. Oh. Such a sudden revelation about one significant other, especially for an adolescent who was experimenting sexually for the first time, was bad for Kathy's intrapersonal and sexual development moving forward. An intimate lie from an early sexual partner fosters a lack of trust in other relationships. No, wait, hold on. Was David transgender? No, we know from interviews with her later in life that David identifies as a woman. She actually goes by her given name, Debbie, but we'll keep referring to her as David because that's how Kathy knew her. But still, for Kathy to be on the receiving end of this deception must have been very confusing. From what we've learned about her family life, I don't suspect she could have counted on her parents to help her understand the situation. No, she couldn't. The subject was never brought up in their household. Kathy wasn't allowed to talk about sex, and so she couldn't discuss her ordeal with David with her parents. Oh, that's a shame. A good line of communication with one's parents is conducive to helping a child understand their sexual impulses and experiences. An adult is far more experienced with sexual culture and, with the right language, can help a child understand the biological and behavioral changes associated with adolescence. It's also more difficult for homosexual teens to broach the topic of sexuality with their parents. Why is that? Well, some parents are not understanding and will throw them out on the street if they learn the truth. Gay teens are more likely to suffer harassment at home or to be kicked out of their homes than heterosexual ones. If Kathy couldn't go to her parents, what did she do after the truth about David was revealed to her? Well, that's the thing. Even after David's mother showed her the photograph, Kathy was still confused. She still didn't know if David was a boy or a girl. So Kathy caught up with David and confronted her, and she told David she knew she was a girl. Then the two of them had sex in an abandoned house. Kathy said she made herself sleep with her so she could see everything. Only then did she accept that her first lover was female. What does Kathy's sexual development have to do with her genesis into a serial killer? That will become more clear later on as we unpack the murders. Kathy and Gwen committed crimes with a sexual motivation, and the development of these murderous sexual urges can be traced back to their tumultuous sexual development. Greg, we should take a moment to make one thing crystal clear. I think I speak for us both when I say we're not suggesting that Kathy's sexual orientation influenced her development into a serial killer in any direct way. Mm -hmm. However, it probably contributed to her sense of isolation, rejection, and confusion as a result of the social stigmas against homosexuals, which I discussed. That's right, Vanessa. We don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. Furthering your point, though, those social stigmas led to David's deception, and this was a traumatic experience for Kathy. Mm -hmm. Well, you sound like you have a specific reason for saying that, Greg. Well, at 16, Kathy repeated the experience with her next lover. He was, as Kathy described him, obviously a man. Ken Wood was a heavyset man, a few years Kathy senior. After their first date, Kathy made sure they ended up at his apartment. There, she had him undress. But she wasn't interested in sex, only in making sure that he was biologically a man. When she saw that he was indeed a man, she was satisfied she could trust him and had him get dressed. After a short courtship, Kathy became pregnant, and she and Ken were married. Ken took Kathy away from her troublesome family life, and the pair of them moved to Walker, Michigan, where she gave birth to her daughter Jacqueline in February of 1980. I'm guessing they didn't live happily ever after. 
Why? Because Kathy's need to know Ken's true gender shows that she wanted to form a normal relationship rather than one compatible with her sexuality. The pregnancy rushed them into marriage before they could decide if they were right for each other. Yes, her relationship with Ken was marred by sexual incompatibility. Though Kathy was unhappy with Ken, she felt dependent on him. They stayed together for another seven years, before Kathy demanded a divorce in 1986. Ken left with her daughter without a fuss from Kathy. Once she was on her own, Kathy had to look for a job. Because she had no skills, she began filling out applications everywhere. One of them was for the job of nurse's aide at the Alpine Manor Nursing Home, not far from where she lived. She had experience in her teenage years as a candy striper. That is, a volunteer nurse, so-called for the red and white stockings, which accompanied the uniform in those days. She had fond memories of the job and thought the experience would carry over. She got the job, bought a truck, and started to feel like she could make her own decisions. She had a new sense of independence at Alpine Manor without Ken. And it was at Alpine Manor that Kathy would encounter Gwen for the first time. But to form this relationship, she probably had to get over her sexual hang-ups. Did her newfound independence lead to a sexual reawakening? Well, once Kathy broke away from her unsatisfying heterosexual relationship, she felt free to express herself in other ways. Luckily for her, there was a thriving lesbian community at the Alpine Manor. One of Kathy's co-workers at the time, a nurse's aide, described the nursing home as a cubby of lesbians. After six months of working at Alpine Manor, Kathy met an 18-year-old woman named Dawn who started giving her attention. It was at this point, at 25 years of age, that Kathy began to believe that she was gay. So she began her first same-sex relationship with Dawn. The lesbian culture which surrounded Alpine Manor became a positive outlet for Kathy. No longer was she as shut in as she had been during her time with Ken. She began a very active social life, going to movies and bars and drinking and shooting pool with her newfound friends. For the first time in her life, Kathy had found a group of people who understood her. Furthermore, in Dawn, she had found a companion who could satisfy her emotional and sexual needs. It seemed like she was leveling off a little bit, don't you think? She may have been, but then she met Gwen. While Kathy and Gwen were co-workers, Kathy didn't take much interest in her. They had a common relation in Dawn, who was Gwen's friend, but never talked to each other. However, three weeks into Kathy's relationship with Dawn, something about Gwen caught her fancy. Kathy was sitting in the common area, having a chat with Dawn, when Gwen entered the room. That day, Gwen was wearing her uniform with the sleeves rolled up. Even from across the room, Kathy caught sight of the scars running up each of Gwen's arms the scars she'd inflicted upon herself during adolescence. Kathy recollects that this was the moment she started watching Gwen. Oh, that sounds kind of creepy. Why would the scars of self-injury attract Kathy to Gwen? Kathy was not mentally healthy, so we have to look at it from her perspective. A study conducted at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden may help us shed light on this kind of attraction. Psychologists there examined 700,000 men and women with psychiatric diagnoses and compared their marital resemblance with 3 million people without psychological diagnoses. And what is marital resemblance? Well, marital resemblance is when one person in a marriage is similar to their partner in one way or another. A non-psychiatric example of a characteristic which is positively correlated is height. Positively what now? Positively correlated. It means a relationship between two variables, where when one of the variables increases, so does the other. The variable in the height example would be whether a person is tall or short. Since there is a positive correlation for height, tall people tend to marry other tall people, and short people often end up with short people. Being the same height as your mate makes things less physically complicated, right? It's easier to kiss, to hold hands, you get the idea. Uh, okay. But what does that have to do with Gwen and Kathy? I mean, how tall were they? That's not really what I'm getting at. This principle holds true for psychological disorders as well. Though people with psychiatric diagnoses are less likely to marry on the whole, they are two to three times more likely to marry someone else with a psychiatric diagnosis. So self-inflicted injuries telegraph the same thing to both people with psychiatric disorders and psychologically healthy people. Evidence of mental illness. But what is taken as a warning sign for healthy people can be viewed by people with their own psychological disorders as indicative of a positive desired trait in a partner. Exactly. So people with psychiatric diagnoses are more likely to marry and might be more attracted to someone they view psychologically unhealthy, 
So why is that, though? Well, like you said, psychologically healthy people take signs of mental illness as a warning and try not to get themselves involved with people who have mental illnesses. Because of this stigma, people with psychological disorders have less choice in who they can start a relationship with. Because less people will be attracted to them. Oh, exactly. Hmm. But it's hard to talk about marital resemblance in people with psychological disorders in a general sense. There are many unconscious elements which might play a role. Did you find any reasons for marital resemblance among psychiatric patients in your research? Well, uh, like any good study, the one conducted at Karolinska Institute offered alternate hypotheses for the reasons people with mental illness tend to partner up. These individuals might be more likely to wed because they're more likely to be in close proximity. Or like they might meet in a psychiatric hospital or in a support group that deals with the disorder. Right. Also, if an individual had a disorder, it might lead them to be more understanding and less likely to stigmatize others with a similar disorder. Alternatively, the marital resemblance might not come from initial attraction at all. Instead, one partner's mental health issues might cause similar issues in a partner they were married to for an extended period of time. So which of these were specific to the case of Gwen and Kathy? I think Kathy and Gwen were attracted because each understood the psychological issues fostered by abuse and wanted a partner who could understand them too. Gwen and Kathy were both abused by their fathers. Marital resemblance between psychologically unhealthy people increases even more when they have similar or complementary diagnoses. People like Gwen and Kathy, who had disorders which developed at a young age, were even more likely to partner up. And that they did. Their relationship began in March of 1986. It seemed like a positive relationship at first. Well, at least Kathy seemed to enjoy it. Gwen made me feel pretty. She made me feel special. She would do things that I wanted to do. But after a while, their co-workers began to notice negative aspects of their relationship. It seemed like it was Gwen and Kathy versus the world, and people began to steer clear. This attitude came to light in Gwen and Kathy's propensity for games. They liked to play tricks on their patients and co-workers. It seems strange to me that these sort of pranks would drive them apart from their peers. Can you describe some of Kathy and Gwen's antics? Yes, I can. They weren't your usual harmless pranks that most people play. There was a malicious bent to them. Kathy would tell a fellow nurse that she had better watch her husband. Then she would call the husband up and tell him that she'd heard rumors that his wife was sleeping around. She liked to stir the pot, create drama, and watch people squirm. Sometimes Kathy and Gwen involved their sickly patients in the tricks. They would shuffle patients into different rooms without alerting the other staff to create chaos. Nurses couldn't find patients, and patients couldn't get care. That type of behavior is not healthy. A good prank is the simulation of a crisis, not the actual thing. You pull the rug out from under someone temporarily, but after you've had your fun, you set things straight, stimulating a rush of comic relief. It sounds like Kathy and Gwen found enjoyment in creating an actual crisis and watching the train wreck that followed. Why would someone do something like that? It stems from a lack of control. Both Gwen and Kathy were individuals who felt they had no control over their lives. Gwen could not stop her father from molesting her or save her little dog, Misty, from her untimely demise. Kathy was manipulated in her first sexual relationship and then found herself unable to take the reins in her marriage with Ken. You're right. Kathy described their divorce in terms of claiming the power to make her own decisions. Good eye, Greg. That's mm. very telling. These pranks were a way for Gwen and Kathy to claim a sense of power by inflicting it upon others, as their abusers had held power over them. Normally, people create conflict with others with whom they are emotionally engaged. The conflict is an attempt to bring feelings of opposition to the surface so that they may be resolved. But pathological personalities like to create conflicts in which their only emotional engagement is in seeing others lose control. They feel powerful knowing that they're the reason other people are in chaos. So Gwen and Kathy's pranks showcased a pathological need to hold power over other people. Yes, absolutely. Well, it wasn't long before they invented a new game, a game with much higher stakes one which would allow them to exercise the ultimate power over their patients. They called it the murder game. The killings began in the cold January of 1987. What the murder game entailed was a selection process. 
Gwen and Kathy wanted to choose each victim based upon the initial of their first name, and then do the killings in such an order that, strung together, the initials would spell M-U-R-D-E-R, murder. Kathy would make sure the coast was clear, distracting the other staff on duty at the nursing home if necessary. Then, Gwen would enter the selected patient's room with a cloth. Kathy watched from the door as Gwen held the cloth over the elderly patient's mouth and nose, smothering them. After the killing, Gwen and Kathy would retreat to an unoccupied room for sex while the memory of the murder was still fresh. Mm. Dr. Michael Abramsky, a forensic psychologist, described the killings as thrill killings. He believed the killings were an expression of the killer's deviant personalities and were carried out for excitement. It is, however, unusual for women to be involved in this type of killing. In my research, I found that only 5% of thrill killings are committed by women. Vanessa, could you offer any insight into why Gwen and Kathy might have committed this type of murder, given the rarity of a woman's involvement? Did they repeat this process for each victim? Yes, with a little variation, but it was generally the same for each victim. What are you driving at? That detail, combined with the sexual nature of the crimes, leads me to believe that Kathy and Gwen suffered from a type of paraphilia known as erotophonophilia. Well, let's unpack those terms a little bit for our listeners. Okay. One is a subset of the other. Paraphilia exists in a person who is turned on by extreme or dangerous acts. Erotophonophilia is a specific type of paraphilia where the extreme element is the death of another person. Well, we've discussed lust killings. Is that along the lines of what we're talking about? Yes, that's a common term for murders committed with erotophonophilic motivations. I perked up when you mentioned the ritualistic manner in which Kathy and Gwen's murders were committed because erotophonophilic killers murder their victim as part of a ritualized attack. Their goal is to live out a fantasy they've imagined for some time. The ritual is repeated with each of their victims because they can never get reality to match up with their imagination. The fantasy evolves with each experience, creating new facets to be enacted through the next victim. Sounds like a vicious cycle. They need to kill to satisfy their deviant desires, but the experience of killing creates even more murderous ideas. Right. That's why erotophonophiles tend to be serial killers, and could be what we're seeing here. Gwen and Kathy developed a complex ritual, an outgrowth of their deviant sexual fantasies, which was repeated until their relationship dissolved. That's fascinating. But why would anyone risk enacting an elaborate ritual at the crime scene, even if they needed to kill for arousal? Doesn't that greatly increase the likelihood of getting caught? Couldn't they do the killing quickly and then retire somewhere to complete the sexual part? Well, lust murders are known to be psychologically and behaviorally different from killers with motivations of anger or revenge, so they might not always act in their best interest. For some killers, simply murdering the victim is not sufficient for sexual gratification. Despite increasing the time the killer needs to spend with the body, creating more evidence, and bolstering the likelihood of being caught, the rituals are necessary because they serve a psychological purpose. What purpose is that? Is it one shared by psychologically normal people? In a way, human beings have what are referred to as sexual arousal patterns, acts habitually completed before sex. In psychologically healthy people, these patterns include more mainstream types of foreplay, such as kissing or caressing, as well as deviant sexual fetishes like foot worship or bondage. So erotophonophiles use the same psychological processes as normal people, but are turned on by abnormal things. But that doesn't stop them, even if murder is the only thing that will get them off. Imagine if conventional methods of arousal did not fit your sexual arousal pattern. It's safe to say you wouldn't be able to completely give up sex and would proceed to enact rituals which suited your needs. So what's the middle ground here? Do psychologically healthy people ever change their lives in a drastic way to meet their sexual needs? Yes, that's what we see in a harmless way in the fetish community. People will give up conventional vanilla sex entirely. An obvious example of this can be observed in the BDSM community. Can you clarify? Sure. The BDSM acronym is actually a combination of three acronyms, bondage and discipline, dominance and submission, and sadism and masochism. People in the BDSM community claim one or more of these concepts as part of their sexual identity. I'm confused. 
What does it look like in an actual relationship? Okay. In one example, each half of a couple will take on the role they identify with based upon their fantasies. One is the dominant, who takes control during sex, and the other is the submissive, who offers up control. The roles fit their patterns of arousal and are a continuing theme, if not a hard and fast rule, in the bedroom. So even psychologically healthy people will jump through elaborate hoops to satisfy their sexual desires. Hmm. Is that really healthy? Well, remember, it's psychologically the same with vanilla people. Only people in mainstream society often don't recognize their pattern of arousal. They just see their behavior as the norm. But we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, aren't we? Hmm. I would be far more convinced that Gwen and Kathy were erotophonophiles if there was evidence which showed the development of this ritual prior to the murders, particularly something related to the couple's sexual arousal. Well, listen to this. On Halloween night, 1986, less than three months before the first murder, Kathy and Gwen attended a costume party. Showing off her twisted sense of humor, Gwen decided to dress as an Alpine Manor patient. Around her wrists and ankles was a set of medical restraints, the kind used to subdue a patient exhibiting behavior harmful to themselves or others. When the couple returned to their apartment, Kathy bound Gwen to the bed with those restraints. Then she produced a cloth, and the two engaged in a sadomasochistic activity commonly referred to as breath play, a sexual activity in which sexual arousal or gratification is achieved through being deprived or depriving someone of oxygen. I guess that's another one of those sexual arousal patterns. It is, but in this case, it's pathologically motivated. Now I'm convinced. Gwen and Kathy weren't just engaging in breath play. They were enacting a prototype of their erotophonophilic murder fantasy. Why are you so sure? Well, I was just getting hung up on the fact that erotophonophiles tend to select their victims based upon sexual attractiveness or by fixating upon one specific quality each victim possesses. Since these serial killers have overactive imaginations, which manifest into elaborate scenarios, they often fixate upon a vivid idea of the characteristics the victim who stars in their fantasy should possess. They have what's called an ideal victim type, a sort of murderous typecasting, if you will. Right, that's the thing. Before you told me about this Halloween escapade, it didn't appear that Gwen and Kathy had an IVT. Of course, they only murdered older women, but that was likely out of necessity. Given the urge to kill, these victims were easy targets. Right, they were frail and sickly. Most of them had a history of dementia, regularly having paranoid fantasies, so they would not have been believed if they did survive. Gwen and Kathy worked in a building where everyone expected these elderly women to leave in a body bag. Death was so much a part of life at Alpine Manor that autopsies were rarely conducted. Yes, but hearing that Gwen dressed up as an Alpine Manor patient during a sexual encounter, which was a clear imitation of the crimes that were committed, changes things. It shows what the fantasy was, and exactly who Kathy and Gwen cast as the victim. Even if this fantasy arose because they wanted to kill, and their patients were the best chance they had of achieving that, the existence of the fantasy suggests an erotophonophilic mind at work. Wow. Well, thanks for breaking that down, Vanessa. No problem, Greg. I was confused before, but now everything's falling into place. Using the murder game to select victims was consistent with an erotophonophilic personality in its anticipatory aspect. Killers of this type exhibit a range of predatory behaviors prior to actually committing a murder. In Kathy and Gwen's case, they played games with the patients, like the one where they switched them from room to room, denying them care. Was there anything else? Yes. They terrorized their victims in more direct ways as well. Some patients reported being attacked or thinking someone was after them. The problem was that no one believed them. But thinking past that, it's right to say that they chose the victims who were easiest to kill. Those patients who were able to fight them off and report the attack taught Gwen and Kathy a lesson. In fact, the murder game never got past the letter M. They dropped the more rigid structure of the murder game and decided to kill only patients who couldn't protect themselves. And that brings us back to Kathy's poem, specifically the conclusion. Mm. You'll be mine forever and five days. Is that some sort of code? Yes, and I'll do my best to explain. After the first murder, Gwen and Kathy became scared that their relationship might dissolve. They wanted to be forever together and having this murderous secret between them gave one a type of insurance if the other ever decided to leave. 
They felt bound together by their lust killings, not only because of the romance, but because breaking up could mean life in prison for both of them. Which would literally lock them together. In light of this murderous pact, they began to talk about the killings in terms of how long they would be together. After they took their first victim, a woman with Alzheimer's named Marguerite Chambers, it was forever and a day. In February, when they killed 95-year-old Myrtle Luce, it became forever and two days. May Mason, forever and three days. Belle Burkhardt, forever and four days. And finally, Edith Cook. That's what forever and five days means. The murder of those five women. Based on what we know from the evidence recorded in that poem, they killed five women before April of 1987, when their relationship ended and Gwen moved back to Texas. It's interesting that you'd refer to the text of that poem as evidence. That seems a little thin for a murder conviction. No, you're absolutely right. What's distinct about the Alpine Manor killings, as opposed to many other sprees, is the lack of any hard evidence. In fact, Gwen and Kathy's trials proceeded with little more than Kathy Wood's testimony. Wait a minute, Greg. A moment ago, you were suggesting that many more murders may have taken place. But if there was no objective evidence, how can we be sure any of them occurred? Kathy Wood was a diagnosed pathological liar who loved to play games with people's lives. So how can we know she didn't make up the whole thing? Well, based upon consistent testimony from others who Kathy and Gwen told about the killings, we can be fairly certain they occurred. But the clock. (laughs) We'll get into the investigation, the arrests, and the trial next week. The events we've covered in this episode were the story according to Kathy Wood's testimony. By looking at the investigation, we'll see how the lack of physical evidence left the true story shrouded in mystery. But one journalist did go to great lengths to present another version of the story. You see, Forever in Five Days is also a book. Published in 1992, author Lowell Caulfield's smashing true crime piece uncovered revelations that would put the entire narrative into question. What did he find? Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. But we will definitely get to that next episode. Be sure to tune in for the shocking revelations behind Kathy Wood and Gwendolyn Graham, the lethal lovers, on next week's episode of Serial Killers. Thanks again for tuning into Serial Killers. If you want to listen to any previous episodes of Serial Killers, you can find them on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Spotify, or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. If you like what you hear, please leave a five-star review or tell us what you think on social media. We're on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. It seems simple, but it really helps our show. Join us next Monday as we continue delving into the twisted psyches of Gwen Graham and Kathy Wood. Have a killer week. Serial Killers was created by Max Cutler and developed by Ron Cutler. It is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Ron Shapiro, with production assistance by Joel Stein, Carly Madden, and Maggie Admire. Serial Killers is written by John T. Gray and Donnie Goffstein and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. Our amazing voice actor is Sammy Nye. We've been wanting to do something extra for our listeners to show our appreciation for all the support we've gotten since launching Serial Killers. And what better way to say thank you than by giving you even more of the content you love. So we're releasing bonus episodes on Jack the Ripper every Thursday for the next three weeks. The episodes will drop on your regular Serial Killers feed, in addition to our regular episodes on Mondays. Or, for those of you who like binge listening, all three special episodes will be released November 2nd on TuneIn. Just search Jack the Ripper on the free TuneIn app or TuneIn.com. We hope you enjoy. If you can't wait to listen to part two, you're in luck. It's available on TuneIn right now. TuneIn has all our episodes one week early. Just go to TuneIn.com slash Serial Killers to listen for free. That's TuneIn.com slash Serial Killers or search Serial Killers in the TuneIn app. 